Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my friend Devan, uh, for those of you who don't know him. Um, so, uh, Devan is a Buddhist practitioner, member of the Sri Ratna Buddhist Order, and scholar based in Chester at the moment in the UK. And he teaches philosophy and Indian religions at the University of Chester. And I remember him most strongly from the time we used to work on Athona together. Uh, with Athona is the Buddhist arts magazine, the Tree Ratna Buddhist arts magazine. Um, we worked together for quite a number of years. I don't know exactly how many, but um, Devan was the poetry editor and I was uh, one of the, the co-editors or co-publishers. Uh, along with Ratnagarbha. And I just remember really enjoying my time working with Devan and the social connections we had and the shared interest uh, in literature and in poetry, uh, which also shared with Chandradasa as well. So uh, we, we, it was a, a literary cabal <laughs> at that time in Cambridge. So, Devan. Thanks, Shanti Garba. So now it's my chance to introduce Shanti Garba, yes, we go back to a period in the 90s uh, when we worked together on uh, the, this arts magazine. I was the reviews editor, actually. Are you? Okay, sorry. sorry. And uh, uh, Shanti Garba uh, had uh, high ambitions for, our, for this uh, particular magazine, uh, which really was quite a labour of love. Uh, and I'm, so, it's something I'm very proud of producing this arts magazine, uh, which, you know, praise to Ratnagarbha is still going. Since then, Shanti Garba has um, uh, become a nonviolent communication uh, trainer. He now lives in Bristol uh, and he runs workshops around the world in nonviolent communication together with his partner, Gazina. Um, and most recently, he's um, been writing books, one on empathy um, and another called The Burning House, which I see behind his uh, left shoulder uh, on uh, a Buddhist response to the uh, ecological crisis. So uh, it was Shanti Garba's idea for us to have a, a conversation like this about a Buddhist um, response a Buddhist perspective on ecology. So uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm very pleased this has been possible uh, and it's expanded into this whole conference, which is a, a, a marvelous innovation and a contribution to, uh, the, to, to um, uh, the increasing Buddhist concern with environmentalism. So we, should we get Straight into our conversation then, Shanti. Yes. Do you want to lead us in, Devan? Okay. okay. Yes. So, Shanti Garba, you've been uh, thinking and writing about uh, the um, ecological crisis, and uh, you've written a book, which you'll be launching tomorrow. So we won't be talking exactly about the contents of your book, but but you've been spending a lot of time thinking about what it means for a Buddhist to respond to the environmental crisis. And it brings up the question, I think, what is the relationship between Buddhism and this kind of activism? Activism. Do you think there's a direct connection? Do you think, for instance, the Buddha would have been um, an environmental activist? No, I very much hope so. I'll give you a parallel. Of, well, I'll give you an example from the Buddha's life story. Um, some of you may know this, it's called the Rahini incident. And Bhante Sangrachita talks about it, writes about it in um, Buddhism, world peace and nuclear war. So the Buddha went back to his home country, um, up in, up, further up towards the, um, what is now Nepal, um, when he was, uh, or, or had already been enlightened for a number of years. And he got to his home country and he heard that there was just a, the, his, they were just about to start a war between his maternal uh, grandparents and his paternal grandparents. So they were just about the, the Shakyans and the Kolyans. They were just about to go into battle and start a, and start a war. 
And the Buddha, according to the account, went and stood between the battle lines and physically blocked their progress to each other. And, uh, and of course, out of respect for him, they didn't attack each other at that point because, of, because they saw that, well, this is a holy man and you need to respect him. Um, and then he started an inquiry. So he didn't just block the, the road, so to speak. He started an inquiry. He said, what's all this about? You know, what's this dispute about? And nobody knew. The kings and the princes and the warriors already dressed up in their finery with their swords and their spears and their chariots and bows and arrows. Nobody knew. Nobody had any idea what it, what it was all about. So they, they had to go and ask the, um, in the end, they had to go and ask the laborers, the paid laborers uh, who, who were farming um, the area between the, the, two, the two clans. And it turned out it was, it was a dispute about water and about whether there was enough water to, uh, to irrigate the crops on both sides, on the Shakyan side and the Kolyan side. So um, I think there are a lot of echoes there for what's going on right now, actually, that um, first of all, that he physically interposed uh, between them and then started an inquiry. And then also it turned out that the dispute was about resources. And of course, those kind of disputes about resources are almost certain to increase rather than decrease in the next uh, years and decades and generations because of the impact of the climate and ecological emergency. That, that sounds uh, like a really relevant story from the, the Buddhist tradition, Shanti Garba. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, what occurs to me, though, is that you're explaining that, and but um, it sounds there like the Buddha is stepping in as a kind of uh, wise elder into this resource uh, dispute. Mm -hmm. um, but is that especially Buddhist, do you think? Uh, it, it sounds more like um, the Buddha stepping in as a compassionate, uh, wise person. Uh, rather than the story illustrating something intrinsic to, uh, to, to Buddhism about uh, responding to the environmental crisis. Mm. As, as something that uh, I've been uh, pondering, or, and in fact responding to really, is the idea that uh, back in the Buddhist time, it would have been very difficult for anyone to imagine that uh, uh, the environment could come under threat, that biodiversity could could come under threat. I wonder what you thought about that. Well, um, we do know that forest was being cleared for, for, uh, for farmland and also for, for, for cities uh, at that time. So there were still vast tracts of, of uh, virgin forest, but there, was also, there were also cities, small cities and there was farmland, which is gradually encroaching uh, on the forest as, and it has encroached more and more up until the present day. And there is actually a story, um, a Jataka tale, which relates uh, to, to, or gives you a, a, an insight into the, the land at that time. I don't know, would you like to hear that now or we come back to that bit later on? Well, why not? Should we just say what a Jataka is? I'll just say, these Jataka stories are, are, are old folk tales from India, which have been repurposed in Buddhist, uh, in Buddhism as past lives of the Buddha. Yeah, okay. So actually there are three short, short Jataka tales and they're all, they all illustrate this kind of ecological awareness that, uh, and give us an idea also of the landscape of, of, of ancient in India, the literal landscape, as in what the land looks like. So in one story uh, of the Buddha's former life, uh, he's a sal tree, a particular kind of very elegant looking uh, tall tree in the Himalayas. And he encourages the other trees to live in the safety of the forest. Okay, he says to the other trees, live in the safety of the forest. And of course, some of them take notice and some of them don't. And then a great storm sweeps through the region and the trees in the forest survive together because they give each other protection. 
whereas the solitary trees that have ventured into the, the fields and uh, the more solitary, they sustain damage and destruction. And this is a story to illustrate, uh, first of all, that, that, that there, were, there were differences in the landscape. And secondly, uh, to show strength in unity, strength in unity. You know, so that's something that we can learn from trees is that when they're together, they support each other. So we can remember that when we're looking at this uh, climate and ecological emergency. Gee, that's that's a, a, a lovely story. And isn't it quite peculiar that uh, in this story, the Buddha in a previous existence is a tree? Yeah, yeah. he is a tree. So uh, that would suggest that from the uh, early Buddhist point of view, there's not a strict division between, say, plants and human beings. Is that right? Well, um, there, is, um, there is definitely a suggestion of, of karmic continuity between humans and animals and even humans and trees or plants. Yeah, yeah, that is there. There are very strong suggestions that that is the case in the, in the Buddhist tradition. Yeah. Uh, from the from the Buddha, from yeah. uh, something that uh, uh, I, I've been thinking about a lot recently is uh, not so much karmic continuity, or, or rather that this karmic continuity between, say, plants and the Buddha as a human being, it's a way of talking about something that's really relevant today, which is the idea, the possibility of uh, a kind of new animism. A, a way for human beings to think about how we're connected with the whole of the living world. I don't know about you, Shantigarbha, but I see one of the big problems behind, one of the big background problems of the ecological crisis uh, as being the persistent assumption that human beings are separate from from nature sure yeah well that's, in the in tri ratna we've got uh, banti's assertion that that um for buddhism to thrive in the west we we need a change of the background culture to a more sort of polytheistic or animistic uh, background culture and, and background kind of spiritual tradition for buddhism to really flourish in the west uh, it's very difficult for Buddhism to flourish in a monotheistic uh, philosophy or, or sort of background culture. I mean, we're having a go. Nevertheless, I think we also, as Buddhists, we, I, I, I'd like to suggest that we encourage a more animistic or polytheistic uh, outlook, because I think on the whole, that leads to uh, a more fertile ground for, for, for the Dharma to flourish. That's, that's uh, a really nice thought from Bante, and it's one that I've been following up a bit on thinking about well what kind of uh, how do we find uh, this anim animistic way of uh, of looking at life in the buddhist tradition mm. yeah. so shall i just talk about one aspect of that yeah go ahead so there's a well-known story that uh, the buddha or rather the buddha to be the buddha before he was awakened or enlightened um, there's, a, there's the well-known story that as he was sitting beneath the Bodhi tree um, on the night of his awakening, he was assailed by Mara, Mara, uh, a figure personifying the forces of doubt, uh, temptation, uh, the kind of unconscious obstacles to awakening. And uh, in response to, uh, and Mara challenges the Buddha uh, or the Buddha to be saying, uh, what gives you the right, what gives you the right to believe you can become awakened? And the Buddha reaches down and touches the earth. This is a well-known well -known image, isn't it? The earth touching gesture or mudra. The earth reaches, the Buddha reaches down and touches the earth and calls the earth goddess as his witness. I think maybe you write about this a bit in your book. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and uh, th this story suggests, and the, the earth goddess uh, uh, 
appears, she half rises out of the ground. She half arises out of the ground. And uh, witnesses to the Bodhisattva's um, uh, practices, practice of the perfections over many infinite, almost life, countless lifetimes. And uh, this is enough to uh, see off Mara. And, and actually it marks the turning point uh, in, the, in the night of awakening. Uh, the Buddha soon becomes the awakened one. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 this sounds like a kind of uh, a, a, um, a, a story, but it gives us the image of the Buddha necessarily in relationship with the earth goddess who personifies the living earth. So it gives us a sense of uh, awakening itself as something that depends on the participation, the support of, uh, of the, the earth goddess representing the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the, the forces of the earth, you could say, support the Buddha in his in his quest for enlightenment and support and encourage and, and even protect. I mean, you I know you you've written an article about the Nagas who protect the Buddha uh, in the in the lead up to enlightenment. Um, yeah. And what I like about uh, the earth touching Buddha is that the Buddha defeats Mara with a gesture of groundedness. That's another way of looking at it. The, that he, 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 he touches the earth, calls it to witness. And that, that's a sense of groundedness. I love that kind of uh, way that he, he doesn't argue, as it were. He just, he just kind of touches the earth and says, well, the earth is my witness. Yeah. So there's this, for me, there's a certain kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a bit of a fancy, fancy phrase, but I like, uh, there's a kind of sense of embodied cognition about that, that it's somehow embodied that that understanding or that insight it's it's not away with the fairies somehow it's actually grounded in the experience of the, the, the siddhartha's experience the buddhist experience i think this is uh, really important shantigarbha and something that we uh, perhaps as environmentalists can bring out a little bit more what you just described as an embodied cognition uh, means that uh, the Buddha's insight, the very flowering of uh, insight uh, in the Buddha's mind is not simply intellectual. It's not about life or mm. about the earth. It's, it's rather a way of understanding in the body, which is already connected to the earth, which is part of the living whole of the earth. Yeah. The awareness that that is involved in uh, the process of awakening is an awareness that's um, not just bodily, but embodied. And it, in a way, it's uh, it's the the coming to awareness in this body of of a process going on uh, through the whole living world. Yeah. So so yeah. So what. What I like about this is right from the beginning, we're sort of challenging the kind of Western dualism of mind and body or earth and spirit or whatever, and, uh, and, tr and trying to evoke the Buddha the, the, and, the, and the time of the Buddha when uh, people believed that trees were inhabited by spirits. I mean, some people still do. If you're sensitive to trees, you can still get a sense of, of some kind of spirit, particularly at, at older trees. You know, there's some kind of character or spirit there. Why do you think older trees, uh, Shanti Garba? I, I think they probably have more time to kind of settle in and kind of, you know, kind of, kind of get used to where they're living and and relate to the trees and other things around them. I, I, maybe I think maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just my time. Uh, of life. I don't know. But but uh, but people believe that also tr uh, hills, woods. And groves had spirits in them. So uh, this is this this is what we mean by or one aspect of what we mean by animism is that everything had spirit in it. Everything had spirits. There was a spirit, an identifiable, relatable spirit in all these different sort of natural 
phenomena. And of course, we, we know about, uh, we have a Western version of animism in for the form of the Greek myths, the Greek and Roman myths. And of course, in the Celtic and uh, you know, the, the more native uh, North European myths as well. It's interesting you mentioned the trees and groves and uh, woods, uh, Shantigarbha. Do you know the, uh, the uh, stanzas from the Dhammapada where uh, it said that uh, those who go to the trees and, and groves and woods go to an unsafe refuge, uh, whereas those who go to the Buddha for refuge go to a safe refuge. I think this is interesting because this gives us a sense of how the kind of animism that you're talking about isn't like it should be distinguished perhaps from a more what we might call primitive or unreflective animism. It's not that um, uh, a, a neo-pagan who, um, who simply feels a close to nature uh, is doing the same thing as a Buddhist practitioner. There's something about uh, going for a refuge to the Buddha the Buddhist teachings and the Sangha, which uh, is in a way a, a true refuge. But I suppose the point uh, we, we, we need to make now is this doesn't mean um, forgetting our deep connection and reliance on trees, groves, spirits, mm. as it were, our natural home. Yeah, yeah. It's not a kind of uh, instead of. It's more a kind of gathering up and including uh, in, a, in, in awareness, let's say, in, in awareness. Yeah. I've got something else, actually, to, to mention in relation to what you just said. Yeah. You, you mentioned how uh, in, in, the, in the West uh, we have our own traditions of, of paganism. Greek, you mentioned the Greek and Roman myths. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'd like to share how um, the earth goddess that appeared to the Buddha uh, to uh, witness to his efforts uh, is actually just the same as Gaia. Da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can't prove it. I mean, you, what I, evidence? I, Give me the evidence. I'll show you the evidence. I'll show you the evidence. So the evidence is that um, the, 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 the image we find in the Buddhist stories is that the earth goddess half rises out of the ground, mm -hmm. half rises out of the ground. That's, that's quite unusual. And it turns out that this image, now I'm going to press share screen. And there it is. This image of the earth goddess half rising out of the ground comes from Greek sculpture. So here, for instance, you see in this image, uh, Gaia half rising out of the ground. Here in this frieze from a Greek temple of called Pergamon, um, Gaia here is imploring the goddess Athena who, uh, to, to, to show mercy because Athena is about to kill one of Gaia's children called her son Alcyonius. So this is in the Greek uh, story of the uh, battle between the Olympians of whom Athena's one and the Titans of whom Gaia is one. So slightly different mythic context. But this, um, this image of the earth goddess half rising is there. And you might ask, well, how on earth did this image get to get to, to the Buddhist, uh, get to the Buddhists? And the answer is that Greek culture uh, went east with Alexander's armies or shortly after. And the, uh, the country of Gandhara in present day Afghanistan and um, Pakistan mm. actually was a, a kind of Greek cultural enclave. But at the same time, it became Buddhist and the sculptors and artists of Gandhara were uh, representing Buddhism, but using the images and uh, themes from, from Greece. Yeah, I'm gonna go there. So here's another image of Gaia rising from the, gra the ground. In this case, to plead for the life of her son, Polybotes, who's about to be uh, killed by Poseidon. So, and here's 
a sculpture from Gandhara. On the right, you can see the full sculpture. There's the, the Buddha being attacked by Mara. You can see Mara's hordes uh, uh, looking vicious with horns and drums and sharp teeth and swords. The Buddha is calmly touching the earth with his uh, right hand in the earth touching gesture. And can you see underneath the Buddha, there's the earth goddess. I've done a, made a, a lar an enlargement on the left hand side of the screen. There's the earth goddess half rising out of the ground. So now perhaps th there's my evidence for <laughs> the idea that the earth goddess is uh, uh, in fact the same as Gaia. Mm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. But what I do know is that um, the Greeks, the after Alexander, they they moved, they well, they, they settled in Gandhara and then they built their Greco-Roman temples with their Greco-Roman statues. And the Buddhists didn't have any statues in their temples. So so then the Buddhists said, well, said to the you know the, the stone the stonemasons. Can you make us some sculptures based on those, you know, the, the Greco-Roman ones down the street? And that's what happened. That, that, as far as I know, that's kind of how it how it emerged. That kind of that, that iconography moved from, from Greece all the way to India and then sort of into Indian culture generally through the uh, icon iconographic tradition. Is that is that your your understanding of how it works? More, more or less Shantigarbha. I think the, the tradition of representing the Buddha mm. in, in sculpture mm. slightly predates that, but the, the, the Greek and Roman style of sculpture in Gandhara contributed an enormous amount to the development, the new development of um, images of the Buddha in stone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, that's something to another connection between India, Indian culture, Buddhist culture, and and the West. Yeah, more sort of Western Mediterranean culture. It give, I think it it gives me some uh, confidence, Shantigarbha, that mm. as Westerners, uh, we we don't need to think that Buddhism is a Eastern religion whose mm. myths and stories are somehow uh, not part of our, not connected to our own culture. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. By connecting with our own uh, pagan myth mythology. Uh, we actually come into a relationship with uh, with uh, uh, a deeply connected uh, imaginative world mm -hmm. uh, in which the Buddha and the Earth Goddess and Gaia are all uh, in in dialogue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so you touched earlier on the Bodhi tree and um, tree worship actually continues at Bodh Gaya, even today, you know, the Bodhi tree, we, you know, and that actually, um, I found it very powerful going to Bodh Gaya and, and just enjoying the presence of the Bodhi tree. And the Bodhi tree is, uh, is as important and present there as the seat of the Vajrasana, as the, the temple as well. There, there, there are different kind of different focuses in a certain, certain kind of way of for, for devotion, but the trees is an important object of devotion. And um, would you like to say something about the Bodhi tree and the significance of the Bodhi tree? Yes, thanks Shanti Garba. Yes, people collect leaves of the Bodhi tree, don't they? Take them home as, uh, as, uh, as kind of important reminders of Bodh Gaya. But uh, what you said, that people treat the Bodhi tree as just as important as the Vajrasana, the, the, the stone seat where it's believed that the, the is the very spot where the, the Buddha gained awakening. And of course, it's believed that the Bodhi tree that's now at Bodh Gaya is a distant descendant of the very tree that, uh, that grew there. Of course, there's no way of knowing, sure. but that's, the, that's the, the belief amongst many Buddhists. Um, so it, it, it brings up this question of, well, why why um, do people worship the Bodhi tree just as much as the Buddha? And uh, looking into this, I've, I've found that uh, what's meant by the Bodhi tree in uh, early stories of the Buddha is not just a tree or an 
old tree or a venerable tree. It's rather a, a symbolic or imaginative tree. It's the tree of life. Uh, the, the tree of life, which is at the center of the universe, which is the, the, uh, the, the world tree, the, the axis mundi that holds up the world, as it were. Uh, a bit like Yggdrasil, the, um, the, the primal ash tree of Norse mythology, which is in a, in a way a symbol for the, the living whole of the, of the cosmos. So uh, following this, if we look more deeply into the idea of the, the Bodhi tree, we again come to the idea that the Buddha's awakening takes place in relationship to the world tree, to the tree of life. Mm -hmm. So the Buddha's awakening can't be separated from his taking a place at the uh, root in relationship to the whole of the living whole of nature. So to my mind, this suggests again, a kind of uh, animistic uh, worldview, an animistic understanding of what uh, what's involved at the real heart of Buddhism. It's coming into um, intimate relationship with the whole of nature. And it's rather a different image of Buddhism, I think, to uh, a, a kind of more popular or perhaps one that uh, we get um, in certain accounts in which Buddhism is about escaping from Sangsara, for instance, mm. or uh, ending Dukkha. A kind of psychological account of Buddhism. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and so it's a couple of things come up there. One is when people think about Buddhism, well, they think about the Buddha, he's a guy who sat under a tree. Let's face it, he's a guy who gained enlightenment under a tree. And that that is so integral, isn't it? The fact that he was sitting under a tree and the tree was protecting him. So just to just acknowledge him, I think. And then um just shortly after his enlightenment the buddha looked back at the bodhi tree and all he could feel was just this tremendous gratitude towards the bodhi tree for uh supporting him for protecting him and when he spoke about trees he he spoke about trees as basically protective habitats and regarded and and uh, he said to his disciples, well, if you, you know, if you kill a tree or even if you kill a plant, then that that is unskillful and something to confess. You know, so he was very protective of trees and the natural world in general and, and encouraged his, his, you know, had a, he had a great sense of reverence for life, not just for animal life, but also for plant life as well. And of course, it's said that um, at the uh, end of his days, when he's very ill, he, he, he took his final uh, place on the earth, lying between two sal trees. That's it. So, as it were, he his his last few uh, his his last hours on earth were spent in the company of, of trees, as well as the company of his uh, disciples. Yeah. So we talked about the earth goddess and the earth touching Buddha, and we've talked about the uh, the Bodhi tree. Could you, tell, could you tell us a bit about the Nagas? Because this was something I didn't really go into in my book. And uh, I'm very curious about what, you, what, you've, what you've got to say about the Nagas as earth spirits, because they're really a different kind of earth spirit from, from, those, from, from, from the tree or from the, the, the earth spirits. Yeah, thanks, uh, Shanti Garba. Yes, um, uh, it, there's, a, there's a very well-known story, which is quite mysterious that uh, uh, just after the Buddha's awakening, uh, having looked back in gratitude at the Bodhi tree for seven days and nights, as you just mentioned, that he took his place at the root of another tree called the Muchalinda tree. Mm. And while he was sitting there, experiencing the bliss of awakening for seven days and seven nights, a great storm blew up. Uh, this, you could imagine some some thunderstorm out of season. It's not the monsoon season. This great storm blows up. And as this storm is brewing, uh, a snake, a naga, comes up from his home beneath this tree 
and wraps himself around the Buddha seven times and then raises his hood. You imagine a cobra with a hood over the, the head of the Buddha and shelters the Buddha from this storm. And this Naga is called Muchalinda, the same as the tree. So there's some deep connection between the tree and the Naga. When, once the storm blows over, the, uh, the Naga uncoils himself, transforms into a youth and then bows to the Buddha and then goes off. How strange is that? So it suggests part of ancient Indian animism in which Nagas are also in some very positive relationship with the Buddha. And as uh, Shantigarbha said, in India, even today, uh, snakes are regularly worshipped. Uh, it's a culture of not just tree worship, but snake worship, mm -hmm. which isn't the case in all cultures, of course, because snakes, uh, especially in India, are dangerous and feared. And yet these stories about the Nagas, there's lots more stories about Nagas, they suggest that these dangerous powers of nature, these powerful animals um, are nevertheless responsive to the Buddha. Uh, in a way they convert to Buddhism and then help uh, support and care for the Buddha. And the Buddha in turn recognizes their, their power. Mm -hmm. So again, at the level of imagination, you could say, and the level of myth, this shows the Buddha in relationship with these deep powers of nature, these dangerous deep powers of nature. Mm -hmm. and, and in each case, those dangerous deep powers of nature become protective figures, protecting enlightenment. Yeah. And something we talked about uh, yesterday, Shantigarbha, was how this is a, this image of nature as, uh, as of course, trees, beauty, and so on, but also deep, dangerous powers. Yeah. This image of nature is a very useful one to, to explore, isn't it? It's rather different to a kind of postcard view of nature that one might have. But it's all too easy to slip into as we think about protecting nature or protecting mm. the planet, that um, uh, nature is uh, everything that's beautiful and sunny and so on. Of course, nature is the, the living whole with yeah. all the, uh, um, I suppose, suffering and, uh, and difficulty and deep powers <laughs> and danger, everything that uh, is uh, not comfortable uh, for human beings or for other creatures as well. All that is also nature. Yeah. And the no. Buddha was in relationship with it. And, and those uh, deep, powerful forces exist within ourselves, as much within ourselves as externally through, you know, in the, in the, the world that we can see outside, I guess. That's the kind of the, the mirror that's going on there in, the, in terms of psychic forces. Yeah. Yes. OK, so I like that. I like that. So just to remember that there are different, you know, as in the, the, the Greek or Roman tradition or as in the the, the, the na more native pagan traditions, that there are many different uh, manifestations of nature. It's not, there is not just one, you know, there are many different manifestations. Some of them more unruly than others. Yeah. Some of them more deeper under the earth than others, yeah. <laughs> and this now brings us Shantigarbha, but maybe you could say something about um, the Buddha's ethics and how that relates to hmm. this, uh, this that the, the, the meaning of nature in the way we've been talking about it. Yeah, okay, so um, as I was um, researching the book, I found that there isn't just one basis for the Buddhist environmental ethics or for, for an, eth an environmental ethic from the Buddhist perspective, but actually there are, there are a number of different layers to this. So I'll just go through these. So the first one is that in a way it's obvious, we it's in our rational self-interest to protect and preserve the earth. It's in our rational self-interest. We don't want to foul our own nest, uh, you know, because we, we, we need to live in it and future generations need to, need to live in it. 
and just to give just to give an example of this, um, the Buddha went to visit three of his disciples who were collectively known as the Aniruddhas. This is in the I think the Mahatchulakasinga Sutta, um, and they were living in this um, in this secluded grove, and they practiced an intensive they had a, an intensive retreat uh, program, and they maintained harmony with each other, as you, as those of you will know, uh, regarding each other with kindly eyes, blending together like milk and, milk and water. So these are the Aniruddhas. However, from an environmental perspective, this is, this is, this bit's really important. They lived in harmony with the natural world, not just with each other, but with the natural world. So uh, they had various agreements about how they lived together. Uh, and where, if there were any leftovers, any food leftovers, uh, after they'd uh, gone to the village and come back and eaten, then they, they were to throw these leftovers away where there's no greenery. Somewhere where there's no greenery, or, drop, or if you're going to drop them into water, drop them in water where there's no life. So what this is about is just protecting your, your water sources. So if you're entirely dependent on local water sources, you're very keen, very sensitive to protecting them and not polluting them. So this just reminds us that they, they live much closer to the land, so to speak, and much, were much more sensitive to their environment and the resources around them than, than we are today. We just turn a tap, water comes out, seems very simple. But here, the, here it brought them into relationship with all the other animals who use that spring or that well or whatever, you know. Um, um, yeah, and so protecting those water sources for, for, uh, for, for other animals and, and birds and so forth. So they had an, an acute ecological awareness because of their survival and the survival of their environment depended on it. So that's something about not fouling our own nest. Um, and of course, as Buddhists, we want to preserve the possibility of enlightenment for this and future generations. I mean, this is what comes out very strongly from the Pali Canon that, that well, but it, for, for Buddhists, enlightenment is extremely valuable, is, in fact, is the ultimate value. So we want to preserve this possibility. If there's no clean air or water or atmosphere biosphere to live in, well, there's not going to be any future Buddhas. So we, we really want to preserve the possibility of, of enlightenment. So those are the first uh, two, perhaps more rational ones. Could I just yes, uh, mention there uh, what, what you just said uh, as a, a kind of what you described as a rational basis for an ecological ethics. It chimes a bit with how uh, Analio was talking about responses to the environmental crisis, wasn't he? Yeah, he right. was, he's not so keen on uh, some aspects of environmental ethics. He, he, no. he, he thought that we should take uh, an anthropocentric view. Uh, he did indeed, yes. Yes, and that, but and that we're agreeing that, that such a, a view, which uh, takes, uh, looks for human interests, it mm. is, can be a, 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 a positive response to well, the environment. Yeah, I want to say that the you know there are a number of different bases for in, in the Buddhist environmental ethic, and these are two of them. And I'd like to suggest a couple of a couple of others as well. Perhaps more Mahayana uh, bases for environmental ethics. Perhaps less anthropocentric. Perhaps less. Yes, indeed. So um, my third basis is really really comes out of this sense that the Buddha and his disciples his followers had an intense reverence for the whole of life. You know, they, they just, in, in a way, it's difficult for us to imagine. Um, and, and they had a sense of solidarity with the natural world, as we've been talking about with the, the Nagas and the, the Earth Goddess and the Bodhi tree and so forth. So they had a sense of kind of resonance and solidarity, um, sympathy, you could say, in that sense, of, uh, with, with, with the natural world. And this is a basis for environmental ethics, that, that we just feel a sense of solidarity. It's like, these are our kith and kin. You know, these are our relatives here. You know, I remember when I became vegetarian, it took me a little while, but gradually I realized, oh, I'm doing this because 
actually, these animals, you know, that, we, that, I, that I'm looking at, they're my relatives, you know, and I want to relate to them as I would a relative. Uh, so a sense of solidarity with the natural world. So how does this sound to you, Diva? Well, I, I think uh, this idea of um, uh, our solidarity with living creatures is in a way a stronger basis for mm. environmentalism because at the same time as giving us reasons mm. to uh, um, care for other beings and not harm either living beings or, or nature, as well as giving us reasons to do that, it invites us into a much deeper uh, relationship with nature, which we can live out. So it invites us into an insight into our uh, our place in the living world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It arises from a sense of the belonging, a gut sense of belonging mm -hmm. to what's going on, to you know the the, the earth or the natural world or you know other other animals, other species, and so forth. The, the wind, the earth, you know the, the the seasons and so on. Yeah. So I I. I I must say I have a sense of deep re relaxation when I can sort of have a sense of that, that sense of belonging, that sense of, ah, oh, you know, we're part of the earth. The earth is part of us. You know, there isn't that separation. And it strikes me, uh, Shantigar, that if uh, to the extent that we've internalized that sort of relationship, we, we would naturally just stop doing things which would uh, threaten biodiversity or the uh, uh, well-being of uh, the whole living world mm -hmm. is at the moment. Sure, sure. And this this leads on to the my, my fourth suggestion for a basis, uh, which is um, really connected with what David Loy was talking about a bit earlier about uh, the bodhisattva ideal and the the spirit or the eco sattva ideal, ideal, you could say, uh, where really there's just a spontaneous outpouring of compassionate action for the benefit of all. If you see suffering, you want to alleviate it. You take action to alleviate it. You, it's not an, you don't argue about it. You just do it. You know, if you see suffering, you, there's this natural impulse to try to alleviate that, to try to reduce that suffering. And that is an aspect of enlightenment, an aspect of the, the Bodhisattva idea. Yeah. I, I agree, Shanti Garba, and, and actually one thing that uh, has occurred to me, uh, confirmed by what David Loy was saying, was that um, although we've been talking about the deep connectedness of the Buddhist worldview in the past to our uh, engagement with nature now, nevertheless, the meaning of practicing as a Buddhist is bound to... Uh, be changing to some degree now because our situation with regard to the natural world has become so acute. Mm -hmm. Something something Paramananda said on retreat recently that I was on was that um, it's become just ridiculous to think of practicing for oneself. Mm -hmm. It's become ridiculous mm. for, to, to think in those terms as if that can uh, really work mm -hmm. uh, at the moment. Uh, becoming a an, an eco sattva, some form of bodhisattva who yeah. feels for uh, the the plight of the whole natural world is yeah. Yeah. is yeah. is what matters. And this this um, let's see, we probably yeah, we've, I think we've got time for this. So this this brings me to one of the main themes of or one of the themes of the book. The, the, where the book really started when I, in 2019, when I heard Greta Thunberg say to world leaders, I want you to act as if your house was on fire. And this led me back to the parable of the burning house from the White Lotus Sutra. And this whole sense of transforming self and world, and that we are in relationship with what is now a burning house, the, the burning house of, of the world. Uh, in, the, in the parable, there's this burning house and the father is trying to get his children out of this burning house and trying to work out how to do it. And we're perhaps in a similar situation that uh, we see the burning house and we see people continuing with business as usual. And we're just kind of at a loss how to 
how to get them up, how to how to protectively encourage them to leave, uh, to you know, to change the business as usual. And what I what I like about this parable is it helps it, this Mahayana parable. It helps us to think creatively about that 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 the situation that we find ourselves in, the existential situation that we find ourselves in. Of, of we're in a burning house. Okay, so then in the parable, the burning house, the, the flames were greed, hatred, and ignorance. And what about our burning house? Oh yeah, they're the same flames. That's the same flames, actually. We're, it's a, you know, the greed, hatred, and ignorance are also the flames which are burning the, the you know, which, which have led to the climate and ecological emergency one way or another you can argue we didn't know however now we do we do know that the you know the implications the consequences of our actions so we're facing a, a burning world and the flames are the same so how do we get people out and in the parable the father starts by yelling to his kids the house is on fire you're all gonna you know get out as quickly as you can and they take absolutely no notice of him and there's a parallel i guess in our in our times that people are not listening to that kind of cry that kind of <laughs> you know the you know it's been tried it's had only very limited impact even suggesting that people save others do it for others that seems to have relatively limited appeal so so then the the, the father uh, try something else. He has a, uh, a moment, a flash of inspiration. And he, he yells to his kids who are playing with their toys. He says, there are some wonderful toys out here, even better than the ones you've got, even better than the ones you see on TV. You, you know, if you, if you come outside, you can play with them till bedtime. You know, and then they just fight each other to get out of the house. Yeah, so he uses his imagination to imagine what, what they would want, what would get them out of the house, what would, what, what would be more attractive, more fun than the toys they're currently playing with. And I think this kind of appeal to you know, some kind of vision, some vision of, 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 of what, what life could be like outside of the burning house, I think that is probably going to be more effective than you know, the house is on fire, we're all going to die, you know, that kind of thing. Even though a bit of that might actually help to set the stage for the cry of inspiration. And so what, what comes up for you, for, for you when you hear this, Stephen? I really appreciate the way that you're uh, taking this old parable from the Lotus Sutra and reimagining it for, uh, the, uh, for our, our current times, mm. as it were. Uh, and I think this is deeply in tune with the, the, the style of Buddhist teaching, which mm -hmm. is always pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think of, uh, actually, this directly connects with uh, the topic of interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all uh, heard of the idea that, uh, of interconnectedness. And uh, some people have... have have taken, especially Joanna Macy, have taken this idea of interconnectedness as, as a core teaching of the Buddha with profound ecological implications. Mm. And yet from another point of view, uh, if one thinks about this, it, the early Buddhists talked about Paticca Samuppada, dependent arising, only in terms of explaining the arising of dukkha or unsatisfactoriness. The Buddha never talked about uh, our interconnectedness with living beings, as it were. Mm. At uh, least not in the Pali Canon, yes. Not in the Pali Canon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you go a bit later, obviously, if you go, if you go a bit later, so the Avatamsaka Sutra, um, there we have the image of Indra's net uh, as an ecological restatement of this uh, Pratichyat Samapada. And what I mean by ecological is a uh, relationship. It's about repeated relationship between different phenomena. And so it's a kind of ecological understanding of Pratichit Samapada. Well, I, I was going to say that uh, uh, the, the way 
the Indra's the image of Indra's networks in the Avatamsaka Sutra. It's the image of a of a net of jewels, mm. in which every jewel reflects the whole net. Every other jewel is reflected in each jewel, mm. and it's uh, in the Huayen school of Buddhism. It's uh, part of a, an envis envisaging of the deep meaning of the of emptiness, shunyata, mm. the 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 uh, nature of reality, according to Mahayana Buddhism. And I was going to say that I think what's happened, uh, what's been done by Joanna Macy and others, is that they've taken this uh, metaphysical uh, image from the Avatangsika Sutra, from the Hua Yen tradition, and repurposed it as an ecological teaching. Mm. And this is totally in tune with uh, how the Buddhist tradition has always worked. Mm. It's a pragmatic, mm. a pragmatic approach to teaching. A, a repurposing of old doctrines and ideas is completely in tune with mm -hmm. how Buddhism's always worked. Yeah. Even though interconnectedness isn't really there in the earliest tradition yeah. as a teaching. Yeah. So I wonder if we could just visualize that for a minute. Now we've, we've invoked Indra's net. I wonder if we could just visualize it. So um, imagine so, so we've got this net with millions of or infinite number of jewels. However, perhaps imagine this. Um, imagine the night sky. Looking up at the night sky, and there's you're you're somewhere where there's no light pollution. So, and the clouds have parted. So all you can see is millions or billions of stars, billions of points of light. So maybe just close your eyes and just imagine that. So this is this this might be a way to kind of feel a way into Indra's net. And each of these stars, as Stephen was saying, each each star is a source of light and at the same time reflects all the other stars, all the other millions and billions of stars. Every star is reflected in every other star. As if they were jewels with billions of facets. Can you get a sense of that? What that thing? An image. Some people do images. So what comes up for you, even when you imagine in this way or visualize in this way? What came up for me was uh, turning around and seeing the earth, ah. this uh, blue marble uh, mm. illuminated by all these stars mm. in the suspended in this web of uh, starlight. Mm. And of course, the earth is made by made of elements which are the result of the explosions of old stars the earth and our bodies and the bodies of every other living creature are the leftovers of old supernovae. So our lives, the lives of everything are tied together through the story of the universe. Mm, wow. And so even our scientific worldview these days is another retelling of interconnectedness. Mm, mm. That's what came up for me. Yeah, a kind of cosmic or cosmological perspective, you could say. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Quite and and in a way that takes it out of the realm of metaphor. To to it's quite physical. It's quite concrete. Yeah. The Earth is made up from stuff material from other stars and other uh, yeah previous galaxies and so forth. Yeah. Wow. So I, I'm agreeing with you now that your retelling of the burning house uh, invites us into uh, feeling into uh, how we as human beings are uh, a part of the unfolding of the universe. And that's a very positive account of what it is to be human. And we may be in a bit of a pickle at the moment, but um, we've got every reason to think that uh, uh, that uh, our existence hasn't is, isn't just uh, some random uh, fluke of, of chance, as it were. Sure. Yeah. We we've, we've got yeah, the intelligence to to uh, to to find a, a livable a sustainable future. 
Mm, thank you. Well, yeah, we can apply this metaphor quite directly to our current climate and ecological emergency, because uh, if any of the jewels become cloudy, they reflect the other jewels less clearly. Uh, so correspondingly, if any ecological niche in our environment becomes toxic or polluted, it affects all the other niches. The loss of species or habitat in one place affects the, uh, the rest of the system, the rest of the network, the, the environment. And it turns out life on Earth is dependent on a very thin biosphere. It's about 20 kilometers uh, maximum depth height from the, from the depths of the ocean to the highest places where life can survive. Uh, and this biosphere wraps the Earth. So what we put into the atmosphere here in Bristol or Chester or the UK, pretty soon it finds its way around to Moscow or Beijing or Atlanta or, or Auckland and so forth. And if we, if we, uh, if rivers are cleaned, if wetlands are, re are restored, then life across the environment is, is in, enhanced. And this net, net, net of conditions accounts not only for physical and biological factors, but also for human intentions. It's very explicit in the Avatanska Sutra. It's not just physical forces. It also includes human intentions, human, human volitions. And these are critical in determining what happens to the net. So we're interconnected and our actions matter, you know, in a kind of a, a grand scale, you could say, on a cosmological scale, because of our profound interconnectedness with, with all beings and all phenomena. <laughs> I think, I think, yes, it is boggling, isn't it? It is. I think that is a nice place to start to wrap up, Shanti okay. Yeah. We, okay. we, we were going to end by um, uh, chanting the um, dedication of merits. Oh, yes. Transference of merits. Would you uh, need to explain why? Yes. So this was a, a great idea that you suggested, Shanti The The transference of merits is a, a, a series of uh, verses from our Tri Ratna Sevenfold Puja. It's an extract from a text called the Bodhichari Avatara by Shanti Deva. And many of us know it off by heart, it's very familiar. And yet, Shanti Garba, you, you were mentioning that uh, we can also notice in it that um, there's the line just as the earth and other elements are serviceable in many ways to the infinite number of beings. Uh, just as the earth and other elements. Uh, so what's being uh, pointed out here is that um, the stuff of the universe, the four physical elements, earth, water, fire, and air, are, as it were, they're serviceable, they're used in all sorts of ways by all sorts of living beings. But they, they're also what make up all living beings. It points to this deep interconnectedness again. So when we chant this transference of merit, we can bear in mind that we're actually affirming our part, our being a part in the interconnected whole, in which as humans, capable of intentions, we have a, a particular role to play. Is that more or less what- Thank you, yes, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I really, I, I like that. And the, that it's something that is native to our tradition, to a, the Tree Ratna tradition. It's something we recite at the end of the puja. And there's this kind of hidden gem of, well, it's about we're in relation with all beings and we, do, we transfer our merits to all beings, that, that's our uh, constituency, you could even say, it sounds a bit political, but that's our, you know, that, that's, that's the group of people that we're in relationship with, all beings. So should we do that then? Should we, should we recite that? Should we do that together? Is that, is that feasible? Let's do that and anybody else who knows it can join in, of yeah. course. So we'll do it in unison. May, May the merit gain in, in my acting, acting thus, thus go to the, the alleviation of the suffering of all beings. beings.
my personality throughout my existence, my possessions, and my merit in all three ways. I give up without regard to myself for the benefit of all beings. Just as the earth and other elements are serviceable, are serviceable in many ways, many ways to the infinite, the infinite number, number of beings inhabiting, inhabiting the limitless space. space. So, may, so I may I become that which, that maintains, which maintains all beings situated, situated in the right space. So long as, as all have not attained, not attained. Peace. peace.